today. You can go with your Matthew. Um, <laughs> but yeah, for the Matthew lovers out there, I will relate it back to Matthew a little bit after he shares. But um, it's 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 an untraditional thing that uh, we're doing. But um, Josh is going to read a short essay, like reflection about his time at Bible camp. Um, and I wanted to tell you guys why we, I thought this is worth doing as a church. So one, cue the catharsis. Like if you've been around Christian stuff, you've probably experienced some of the stuff that he's experienced. Two, uh, we're here to get to know each other. And this is like a uniquely well-crafted uh, peek into what makes Josh tick. So I was like, oh, it's valuable at that level. Three, um, this has been the result of Josh coming to terms with like what from my spiritual experience feels manipulative and I can't trust versus what in my spiritual experiences do I trust and will I let guide my life. Um, and I think that church should be a safe place to interrogate spiritual experience together, not just a place to be manipulated by spiritual experience, but also to get to like talk about it, right? Um, and then four, we can use this as a jumping off point to talk about some of our own spiritual experiences and like um, how we want to continue to stay earnest and like open, open to them. So, um, if, even if this will feel like unusual to do in church, it's probably because church is kind of a broken place where we don't, we're not used to like <laughs> interrogating manipulation <laughs> and stuff like that. Um, so manipulation but, really slow work. yeah, <laughs> I'll throw candy when, when we say it this way. Um, yeah, it should be a place that we can, yeah, be honest about our doubts, but also like try to learn to be more responsive to God's voice, right? So, um, with that, this is squarely in the domain of like being a church, in my opinion. Yeah, go, go for it. Cool. Hi, people who don't normally come but are on the Zoom because I kept on bombing Facebook. Um, okay, cool. Hi. So, uh, <laughs> yes, and you are on speaker, so we can hear you. Um, Okay, so before I get started, I wanted to I wanted you all to know that I didn't write this for tonight specifically. Uh, you know, Caleb's going to be using this and trying to incorporate it so that it makes some sort of sense. Uh, but uh, I I didn't write it as a, some sort of guide. I originally wrote it to clear my head and kind of entertain people who come across it, just so you know. Uh, okay, here it goes. This is an essay reflection titled Hungry Horse and the Supernature. So I have a crap memory. It's a good thing that I'm trying to write a reflection on things that happen to me, to me, are very important, but also I don't really remember them very well because they happened like 20 years ago. It's as if you're trying to determine why a building stands askew, but in order to observe the foundations, you need to begin an archaeological dig, and you're blind. That is what this is. A blind dig is <laughs> named a blind digger. Today, for your digging pleasure, I will consider that most holy and smelly of places, summer Bible camp. <laughs> summer camp is where I learn how to speak in tongues and how to puke up Hawaiian punch after a spontaneous and foolish decision to fast in August heat at summer camp. It's the place I discovered I'm born to lead and also that leadership is a good way of growing your ego under the cover of holiness. <laughs> it's such a majestic and pungent place, Bible camp. <laughs> So this fetid wonderland was situated in a hungry horse, a beautiful and oddly named hamlet not far from Glacier National Park in my home state of Montana. Camp was its own small world, ancient cheap cabins filled with unwashed tube socks, aged mattresses that had been young when Nixon was not a crook, and dirt paths snaking through the evergreens to the much abused four hole mini golf park. My first year was a misfire. Some clerical error left my cabin of six without a camp counselor looking out for us. <laughs> Naturally enough, the oldest among us, uh, a curly haired sixth grader named Tyler, ended up as the de facto leader. And uh, he lived down to the stereotypes of the sixth grade boy. I learned far more vaguely dirty jokes about pee than I imagine the head of the camp, Keith Elder, would have hoped for. And I didn't join in any of the camp activities. <laughs> I did spend the last half of that week covered in unhappy, itchy red hives. I didn't know enough to tell anyone about it and suffered through them until I got home. It says something about my family's shared physiology that uh, immediately upon picking me up, my eldest sister diagnosed my L's and handed me a pink viscous miracle potion of Benadryl, which she kept in the minivan at all times for anybody who might need it in the family. I'm unsure of whether I even went to Holy Spirit night that first year. It's very possible my cabin missed it 
due to Tyler's <laughs> listless leadership. I made, I, or maybe I slept through it, itching my way to dreamland. I don't really know. I do know I didn't sleep through it the next year. So just so you know, the format of most days at camp followed a pattern. Breakfast, morning tabernacle, breakout groups, free lunch, I'm not paying attention because I'm hungry tabernacle, activities, dinner, and finally, most importantly, the marathon, multi-hour evening tabernacle. Just the fact that it's tabernacle. Tabernacle, right. yeah, it's, it's really great. So tabernacle is a kind of loaded term biblically. Like it only existed, I think, in the Old Testament and it got destroyed by the Romans, but you know, whatever. Tabernacle is quite the term for the worship and teaching services that happen. These events took place in a large octagonal room with orange glass windows and trim that was fashionable in the days of polyester bell bottoms. Depending on the age group and the amount of cash that the camp had at the moment, we sometimes got puppeteers, College sketch groups, scary bad jugglers who ominously <laughs> promise to juggle fire, and your run of the mill itinerant evangelical preachers. It's all of these. The morning and lunch tabernacle were relatively low key affairs, at least by the standards of evangelical, charismatic groups who are known for putting on quite a show, lest someone not find Jesus due to lack of subwoofers. In Hungry Horse, the evenings were the fireworks show. That was the time, that was where the time, effort, and energy was all stored up for. Kids entered the tabernacle at 7 p.m. And the last emotional ultramarathoner may not resurface until 10 or 11.30 at night. The amount of energy it must have taken the staff to hit the highest of the high notes bears witness to how deeply they believed in this stuff. I, I mean, I'm, I'm 34 now, and I'm pretty much ready to throw in the towel at 8 p.m., partially because of the child. Uh, but <laughs> Keith Elder... Who's an, who was an enormously large man of vaguely like Samoan background. He was in his 50s when I was going. And I remember well his beso profundo prayers those late nights, his face glistening with sweat. Microphone like a junior sized ice cream cone and those huge tanned catcher mitts he had for hands. His prayers were very genuine. His sweat was earnest. That spittle soaking into the microphone's phone cover was deeply sincere and also disgusting. <laughs> Mr. Elder passed away some years ago, and I've heard no reverberations about Keith actually being a sinister figure. As far as I know, he was not an HBO villain, using his position of trust to do nefarious deeds in the darkness. He did name the triple patty burger at the snack shack after himself, called it the Elder Burger, <laughs> but I doubt that anybody counts that as rank misuse of authority for just about anybody. I do wonder if Holy Spirit Night was Keith's idea. It certainly was a singular feature of the camp tradition, and Mr. Elder played a pivotal role in many of those. It could have been what he received as the way to do things from his training in our charismatic church denomination, the Assemblies of God. Open Home is not a member of this denomination, by the way. I know the name AG, Assemblies of God, makes it sound like they're the bad guys that the G.I. Joes might fight. But to be fair, the name and the church denomination come from a different time. Our group got its start in big tent revivals in an earlier century. And ecstatic emotional experience is the historic raison d'etre of their existence. We didn't just believe in Jesus or a traditional reading of the Bible. I mean, even Presbyterians believe that. <laughs> if it's as if we brought a triple patty burger to the theological barbecue only to discover that everyone's piling on the extra holiness these days. So what's an extremely sincere and frustrated revivalist in the 1800s supposed to do? Well, they let women into the leadership and they paused to see if anybody would care. It did scare the Baptists, but <laughs> everyone else just sort of shrugged. The Episcopalians said, oh yeah, we'll do that too. And someday we'll have trouble getting any men in leadership. <laughs> so the charismatics, they went back to their tent. They looked at the triple patty burger, they smelled it, they prayed over it. And they said, let's do something really different. Let's make sure they don't forget about us. Let's make it weird. <laughs> Showing up next time to the theological barbecue, they proudly brandished their new constitution. They said, call us the Assemblies of God now. And just look at what we have to offer. Yes, this burger has three patties. Yes, women can lead. But also, also, our constitution demands that, and I quote, speaking in tongues is initial evidence of infilling with the Holy Spirit. We went the extra mile. Remember that weird sauce at the beginning of the book of Acts? We're putting it on everything. 
and we're not letting you take it off. <laughs> so for those unfamiliar with highfalutin church speak or confused grilling metaphors, initial infilling means that a person will speak in tongues when they receive the Holy Spirit. And real Christians, ones, you know, who are like worth their salt, obviously have the Holy Spirit. Therefore, only people who speak in tongues are actually Christians. So take that, Methodists, recoil and horror, Presbyterians. The weirdos in the tent went there. They made speaking in tongues the thing. Yes. So what is, you may ask, speaking in tongues, actually? Depending on who you ask, it looks like a, a lot of different things. But at the root, basically, it means saying things that aren't in a language you already know. So speaking in Spanish would count for me as speaking in tongues, but not for Rudy. Um, <laughs> Singing Yabba Dabba Duda until uh, you are hoarse would count for me and also for Rudy. <laughs> Speaking in tongues tends to look and tends to also include a lot of crying and clutching your your chest as if you're having the holiest of heart attacks, at least from what I recall. Given its importance and how unlikely it is that that sort of thing will just kind of happen at the mini golf course, uh, something has to be done at the Bible camp. And Thursday night was Mr. Elder and the camp's way of creating the most likely environment that the largest number of sweaty, tired kids would burst forth in their angelic language. Um, angels, you may be surprised to discover, sound a lot like prepubescent kids screaming pig Latin until they go hoarse. So Holy Spirit Tabernacle Night was the high point of Thursday night. It was Thursday night every year. But, and that was the high point of the week. And they hoped a guaranteed way to shovel those roomfuls of kids into the holy light of salvation. They'd soften us up with worship, where we would repeat Matt Redman's 10,000 Reasons course for approximately 45 minutes. Then the main event would begin. They did everything to make it land, including, but not limited to, showing us clips of 80s an 80s action film in which communists shoot up a high school, dressing up as college intern, dressing up the college intern as Jesus to be killed in front of us. And puppet shows. <laughs> they threw everything at us. I mean, sometimes literally. I recall a preacher once tossed Skittles into the audience of middle grade schoolers. And there was a feeding frenzy, kind of unlike last week, where you uh, and, uh, and the, the point of the throwing of the Skittles was to illustrate how Demons would pluck away at your devotion to God, like the birds from the parable of the soil. Yeah, and yeah. They didn't say it though until after all. They, they said it after the kids were grabbing. Yeah. 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 And, and after that, when one of the kids, like 20 minutes later, was talking to his buddy, he pointed the kid out and he said, you are plucking away this kid's devotion from God. Stop talking. It was really weird. He was trying to make a point and I guess he did. Might have scarred the kid, but you know, got to do what you got to do. <laughs> okay, so I realize I'm giving this all a really bad rap and it sort of deserves it. But you <laughs> had to see the preachers. I mean, when they got going, nothing could stop them. They, they blew out their vocal cords just about every Thursday, convincing us that the spirit was coming, the spirit was coming, coming tonight. And like a good gentleman, the spirit did come. A line would form to be prayed over by the preacher. Kids would weep. Everybody wept. Sometimes people were healed. Uh, sometimes people laughed aggressively in the Holy Spirit. Uh, that was weird. Uh, sometimes people were slain in the spirit, uh, which if you've not heard of it is code. For falling over and having the sense to stay put for a while. Um, and the first year I went, I, I, I tried the Holy Spirit stuff. It didn't take. Uh, it was it was pretty upsetting. Yeah. I went home to ask my parents and sisters about it, and I learned that we share more than a physiological repulsion to vegetation. Nobody in my family spoke in tongues. And my sisters are all older than me. My dad, who, you know, was the arbiter of truth, had tried, and it didn't take for him either. So metaphorically, that meant that not all hamburger, hamburgers needed the extra sauce, or at least not a cup and a half of it. This astounded 12-year-old me, because here are two groups who are obviously, you know, right about everything all the time, but they didn't actually agree. 
And I, I understand under, and could understand at the time that some things are just preference, like how some people advise you not to drink too much soda pop and others like my dad drink 12 Diet Cokes a day. <laughs> but other things are just true or not true. The sun sets in the West, it doesn't matter who you are. That's just true. And the Holy Spirit night felt more like a sun thing than a soda pop thing. So naturally, with these deep and shared family doubts, my parents sent me to Hungry Horse again the next year. Uh, <laughs> come Thursday, I found myself in line again. <laughs> uh, uh, that might be weird, might sound odd, but even then, I guess I had a crap memory. Uh, the sweaty, itinerant creature prayed for me. And much to my surprise, I spoke in tongues. Okay, so I'd assumed, I was 12, I'd assumed I would begin to float a little as I spoke in my personal <laughs> angelic language that sounded like I'd recently gotten a shot of Novocaine. I, I, I'd assumed my blood would light on fire or my sweat would run cold. And it all seemed, you know, awfully important to Mr. Elder and everybody in the AG. But my sneakers did not gain anti-gravity properties. My blood stayed warm and dark and liquid, safely tucked away inside my body, running its internal course as per usual. My mouth was another story. It ran on its own. I didn't feel that I had a lot of control over it. I could start it. I could stop it. But control it in the middle? I mean, I, if I wanted to. But this odd sensation of also having the option to not control my speech that was the OS update. That was the new thing. Um, and the weirdest part of it all, really, honestly, the weirdest part of that experience in the months afterwards, it didn't really matter. <laughs> I was still nervous around girls. <laughs> you know, my tube socks, tube socks still moldered away in an unwashed pile in the corner of my room. I hadn't gotten vertigo in the Holy Spirit by being slain in the Spirit. Was that the problem? I didn't think so. That part and the Holy Spirit making the college intern in the corner laugh uncontrollably, that was apparently all optional. But I'd, I'd done it. I could speak in tongues now, and I, I felt pretty much the same. I went home from Hungry Horse not any less confused. I spent the year not using my newfound superpower. It did not help me in English or PE, or at my first compulsory seventh grade dance, where a girl, uh, where a friend got a girl to dance with me towards the end of the thing, first dance. Uh, and it was to Kryptonite by Three Doors Down. I remember that well. Seventh uh, yeah. <laughs> grade dances are hard to dance. Uh, it also didn't help me be a better Christian. I mean, seventh grade was a year filled with highs and lows, I mean, I read Douglas Adams for the first time, which is a personal lifetime, all-time high. Um, I got a D in typing class, which was an all-time low for me. Um, and yet I could not, I could not stop sneaking computer time to look at porn. And it's that last one that concerned me the most, as I had learned that Christians, you know, they don't look at such things. But the burgeoning internet, you know, it knew otherwise and was well on its way to finding its true calling as an information superhighway for anonymous lost. I mean, did you know that the average American sees porn for the first time at age nine? Mm -hmm. uh, by that standard, I was actually a late bloomer, but I did eventually find it and it was thrilling and terrible and I could not stop. I had found something that set my blood on fire and it made my sweat run cold. And yabba dabba doo -da wasn't doing much to stop it. I was also, of course, deathly afraid of anyone in my family, some of whom are watching, uh, from actually finding out about it, uh, because it would obviously lead them to conclude that they were living with a twisted sociopath. First of his kind. Thus, I returned to the hungriest of horse Bible camps with a heavy heart the next year. I was 13. I would have been an adult if I was Jewish. And I was trudging through adult themes and explicit content, bewildered and lost, not willing or able to talk to anybody about it. Mm -hmm. Thursday night came and, you know, I shrugged off the whole independent moving lip dance of speaking in tongues. I'd been there, done that. And I was asking the big question now, God, are, are you real? Mm -hmm. And this may seem kind of odd. You may think given that 
the spirit of the Most High had manifested in the tabernacle upon my chaplet a year ago that the answer would be sort of obvious. I mean, who else, you may ask, would be moving my mouth if he wasn't? If you saw a movie where a troubled young woman went to a seance and asked for the spirit of the late comedian Robin Williams to attend to thee, when she began spouting witty and off-color monologues, the who part of that mystery would seem rather obvious, right? Clearly, Mrs. Doubtfire himself has visited upon her his wit. <laughs> My apologies if that reference and comparing Ouija boards to the Holy Spirit seems blasphemous. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Uh, I'll blame it on my simple-mindedness that I was asking that question as a kid. God, are you real? With what probably should have been an obvious answer. I was literally surrounded by people manifesting that initial infilling that my forebears wrote literally into the Constitution. I had done so and still could do so. It, it couldn't have been more obvious if the spirit had descended like a dove with a t-shirt, proudly announcing, he's one of mine now, move over, say. I mean, it was pretty obvious. And yet, the Holy Spirit may have controlled my mouth at times, but, you know, Satan had a firm understanding of other parts of my body. Uh, and, and who could tell? Maybe speaking in tongues is all some sort of weird shared hysteria. Uh, I know many of my neighbors in this fair left coast liberal city would basically conclude as such. It's some combination of fatigue and suggestibility that would do this to this flock of unshowered rural children, like the Salem witch trials, but here the devil is the Lord and the women are gawky Montana kids. I mean, these kids would give in to anything. They live outside a city, right? Case closed. Thus, with doubts looming, I asked God whether he was real. I needed a sign and a better one this time. Please. It was in the waning light of evening that I asked this. The light had shifted from clear to amber, filtering in through the double doors of the tabernacle. The itinerant preacher, a different one than last year, had prayed for me, and I got on my knee, as I had seen in countless vaguely inspirational Christian posters. I raised my hand up to Jehovah Jireh, and I'd assumed the posture. I had the question on my lips. I really did want to know. Okay, I imagine that God's answer would involve me flipping. Like, actually, that's what I thought. Um, why I had this recurring desire, I don't know. I mean, this was the beginning of the superhero movie craze, so maybe it was that. You could blame the Bible, though. The Holy Spirit did lift up Jesus at his baptism. I mean, lifted him up, right? Uh, so why not me? The Holy Spirit was always vaguely bird-like in my childhood imagination, like a comforting, semi-transparent pterodactyl <laughs> so give me a lift bird thing right you can do it and i did not float uh much the opposite actually i was pressed down annoyed that my legs were giving out whilst i was struggling with the lord i pressed up and something heavier than gravity took me down again so it was heavier but it wasn't like lead weight my dad spent has spent his entire career as a medical malpractice attorney prosecuting cases where people were horrifically maimed by misapplied pressures. Car crashes, falling into holes, flooding behind cars, unexpected pressure I have learned deeply and have cataclysmic results on the human body. And this was not thankfully that. It was persistent, but gentle. It was like a parent applying pressure to a toddler that wants to get up from the nap, but it isn't actually quite time yet, and there's still actions. So I ended up awkwardly with my back on the floor, my legs akimbo and splayed out on either side of me. Were a supernatural force to do that to me now, I will let you know, I would pull something and need PT for weeks because of God. <laughs> but at age 13, I was flexible enough to yield without any discomfort at all. There was no explanatory definition accompanying this act, no angelic whisper explaining why God had seen fit to kind of mash me to the floor. It just, you know, I don't know, it happened. And there's plenty of reason to doubt. I was tired and suggestible, see above. And of course, who really believes a 13-year-old about what happens to them? I mean, they're kids. I also still sometimes doubt what occurred to me that, light, that night. 
maybe my memory is dimmed. Maybe 13 year old me was full of hungry horse stuff. I took it out. You're welcome. Kid. I didn't swear. So it's family friendly, I guess. Uh, the event had surprisingly little effect on me, my life. God had, I think, seen fit to actually answer me. And I said, oh, oh okay, cool. <laughs> I was zealous in my years of high school after that, but I would honestly attribute that more to the apologetics books that I borrowed from my dad's bookshelf and the high energy environment of my youth group than to a physical presence pressing me down. You know, I actually forgot about this event when, you know, a couple of years ago at Open Home, I was asked to tell my life story. I, I clean forgot it. The experience had literally become so irrelevant to my current meandering walk with Jesus that I didn't remember it when I was asked to talk about my life. I have, in the past couple of years, learned that the Hebrew word translated as glory in the Old Testament when, to des when describing God is kavod. At Mount Sinai, in the book of Exodus, quote, the glory, kavod, of the Lord was like a devouring fire on the top of the mountain in the sight of the people of Israel. God's glory was like fire that out ate the landscape. God's glory has weight. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if the people of Israel got an angelic explainer when they saw his glory. Based on their later conduct in the book of Exodus, I kind of doubt it. The Lord often just sort of did stuff in the book of Exodus. And maybe the Lord still just kind of does stuff. And in an act of extreme optimism on his part, he just leaves us to figure it out and how to live in light of it. I know that all this Holy Spirit stuff still freaks me out now. I'm not sure that it should, but it really does. So do very large groups of people, uh, Christians enthusiastically cheering on a guy on stage, like they did at Bible camp. It sort of gives me the heebie-jeebies. But I do not deny that both of those things had a meaningful uh, impact on my youthful faith. And it was far from all bad. I mean, in fact, a lot of it was pretty good. So not everybody who experienced the hungry horse's supernature came away with that same sort of certainty that I have. Um, one friend, a piano prodigy who spoke in tongues, lost his faith at a music conservatory that he later went to and gained an appreciation for cheap cigarettes instead. Another friend uh, lost three quarters of his faith while in pre-med. His former faith now dangles like a useless appendage in his life, just kind of flopping around tries to forget about it, but occasionally it intrudes on his life. I guess it didn't really do much for either of them. But for me, it's become a background hum of assurance. I, you know, I don't wonder if anybody's listening when I pray. I really don't, hardly ever. It's only happened a few times that I've wondered that. In that, I know I'm sort of exceptional. I know a lot of people do wonder. Maybe it's partially due to the physical presence, the weight of a glorious and patient God making himself known. As I recall, after the pressure eased that night, I got up, dusted myself off, noted in my double XL sized study Bible that I'd rededicated my life to the Lord, and then I went to the sleep shack. <laughs> I avoided the triple patty burger that night and still do avoid the equivalent woo holy spirit stuff now. It's all kind of weird and stressful to me now. However, despite all of the oddity, I've come to value these strange and inexplicable things that happen. Maybe, just maybe, God is bigger and less predictable than my assumptions. And maybe, just maybe, that's a good thing. We all could use some assurance of God's loving presence. And whether it's high-energy linguistics or a gentle weight pressing down, maybe that's worth remembering and accepting. Thanks for listening. Wow. Thursday nights. Yeah. It was always Thursday night. So we're gonna use this as a jump off point to kind of talk about some of our experiences growing up and and what has shaped us, what have we kind of thrown out and stuff. But I wanted to highlight a few things, um, like with the tongues thing. Thank uh, you. That was yeah. Um, yeah. Wow. Thank you. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, I was gonna say, <laughs> you right. <laughs> so anyway, like he talks about like um speaking in terms like not like changing his life and be like, what what's that all about? Um, but that's actually like pretty biblical where uh Paul says like if you speak in the angel, in terms of angels but you don't have love, you're just a resounding dog. Like it's it's completely worthless. Like ecstatic spiritual experience that's not uh doesn't create long term love in your life is is Paul thinks it's like problematic. And in the next chapter saw God the whole time. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Didn't do anything. Yeah. Yeah. And then in the next chapter, Paul's like basically whenever Paul's talking about tongues, he's like, This is kind of problematic. Can you guys like stop so much because you're freaking people out with it? (laughs) Um, every time. Yeah, like that's pretty that's pretty much every all he talks about with it. So there's that. That being said, like I love being in tongue situations. Like I love to go pray. I don't like I love praying with them. I dabble in it a little bit myself. Um, <laughs> but I always hate like there's always the time where they go looking and hunting in the room for whoever's like not speaking in tongues. And like I've had people like push on my head and I'm like pushing back and I'm like, yeah, that's <laughs> like <laughs> no. <laughs> I have to like speak in with my new <laughs> Anyway. Um yeah, like that's that's like it's really messed up and bizarre, and it's happened to a lot of people. And I'm sorry about that. Um, and and then the other thing that I wanted to kind of draw out and, and, and let us talk about some is kind of these questions. Is like um, we want we want church to be a place where we can both interrogate our spiritual experience and learn how to stay childlike and open to spiritual experience. Um, and those things may seem like opposites, but they're actually I think kind of balances to each other, so that we can actually like come to an inner harmony where we where we know how to identify the voice of God. That we need to be able to like think critically and ask questions and talk about in our spiritual communities about when we feel manipulated or when we feel uh like something's getting forced on us that isn't real. Um to, A to just be able to heal from it and, and to be able to want to even try to to take a leap of faith again in the future. Um but also so that we know that we have the internal integrity so that like when we actually do believe that it's God speaking, that we trust ourselves. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I want us to get to, like, yeah, I, th- I want that to be, like, a culture piece of, like, how we are as a church, that we can, like, think critically, but we're also, like, after this childlikeness w- that is 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 ready and open for God to have these really shaping experiences for us. Um, and I love when he was talking about how it became this background home of just, like, I don't have to wonder if there's someone there when I talk to God, right? Um, and then another thing I wanted to do is like related briefly to the Matthew stuff that we've been learning. So like uh, something that's come up a bunch already uh, is is God speaking to people in dreams, right? So we have Joseph and uh, uh, God comes to Joseph in a dream and says uh, the baby that Mary has is from God, and that's like hugely emotionally freighted for him that like. He was going to get married to her, and now he, he's, she's cheating, so it's like completely destroyed his life. And then he is willing to just trust one dream that that, that that's true and from God, um, and to reaccept Mary and to accept Jesus as as his own son. And then the next chapter, the wise men come to see him based on a dream. And then right after that, uh, they have another dream that says like you need to leave here and go to Egypt, or otherwise Herod's going to kill you. So there's this repeated thing where it's like the dream space is a place where God speaks, right? And something I love about that is like sometimes we have to close our eyes in order to see what is spiritual. Like we need to stop getting all this information from this world in order to be able to be open to what God wants to speak to us. Um, and that there's this blessing of scripture that our imagination can actually be a place that God comes and, and, and speaks to us, right? Um, and it's even that Paul thing of like, when he began to spiritually see, he became blind. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I think there's a way that we, yeah, we do need to close our eyes in order to see God. And um, my, my what, what his story made me think of is like my most grounding spiritual experience that I've had in my life was uh, I really wanted to quit working for an university Christian fellowship because it was going really poorly. I was like, Jesus kind of quit. I, I since Jesus said, close your eyes. I closed my eyes. Um, and then there was this woods right outside of our apartment complex. And I sensed Jesus like kind of in front of me. And um, he was like, follow me. So I, I started walking in the woods. I walked like a half mile and I didn't hit were any you, trees. Yeah, were your eyes closed? Yeah, my eyes were closed. I was walking in the woods uh, down like the pathway, but it felt miraculous because I wasn't 
my eyes weren't open and I was walking the right way. And then like uh, about a half mile in, um, Jesus said, like, open your eyes. And I saw a six foot high dead stump. And then out of it was this huge tree that was growing out of it. Mm. Um, and, and as soon as I saw it, Jesus was like, um, this is a picture of out, of out of death comes life. And I want you to die your own ego and future so that you can have the life that I want to give you. Um, and that has been like the lens I see pretty much all of my life through, uh, like ever since that spiritual experience, right? And so like, could I look at it and be like, oh, it was just random and weird, like, sure. But um, like him with the mashdown experience, like the guy, like, um, I don't want to look at it that way. I want to look, I want to be childlike and open and say like, that was, that was actually God teaching me something really critical and the lens for my whole life right there. Um, so yeah, when we're breaking in, up into our little groups, like we want to be able to talk about the negative or manipulative experiences, but we also want to want to think about like, how are we staying open to, to God actually being like real and, and speaking to us. So um, yeah. So uh we're gonna we're gonna sing a few songs at, for for like a reflection time. And then we have the reflection questions for the folks online. If you guys want to stick around, um we'll mute ourselves. If you want to stick around and talk to each other about some of the reflection questions, feel free to or if you just wanted to hear a story and pop off, that's totally fine too. Um but yeah, so We'll sit around communion, reflect during the worship, then we'll break into small groups to talk about that stuff. And will someone pray us in? No. Oh, does anybody have the lyrics? She's a, um, yeah, we just like can't put you in a box. Um, like sometimes we think we understand the ways that you want to talk to us or move us. And at the end of the day, like we just really don't. <laughs> um, and I know that some of us, yeah, have had. Yeah, supernatural experiences that we like need to unpack. And then there's others of us who maybe haven't had anything that has felt weighty. And that is also like maybe sometimes equally feels traumatic or like leads us to doubt or. Um, so I. Um, Thank you that your spirit is real and I thank you that you have made all of us like really unique and different and it's beautiful that you speak to us and unique in different ways because we're all your unique individual children um, and so I pray that as we enter into this kind of reflection that you would just like break down your peace that if there's me um yeah, maybe some things come up that are just like not of you or not of you. like, oh, maybe I didn't feel like this. What does that mean for me? Or uh, maybe we're second guessing some stuff. I don't know. I just pray you pull that all away. Um, I think you that we can't put you in a box. You think you're going to do one thing and then you do something else. And that's the thing that needs to be done. And so you can just you're just really good, Jesus. And I pray that as we enter this time of reflection and talking, that that's, yeah, we would just get more of a sense of your weightiness. And that you are really real, but you're also uncontrollable. You can't control the ways that you want to death. are good and meant for each of us. Like, yeah. So, I pray that it would be easy for us to end into worship by the Lord Jesus. This is really simple. As our Jesus circumcised the land, offer grace when they have a song. As he came with his journey, 
Let us go with our hearts and our to the broken world. 